Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from 1 John. It's not the Gospel of John, it's 1 John. This is a little bitty book in the back of the New Testament and you'd probably get there faster starting at the back going toward the front. 1 John, and I'll be reading chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 3. And this is what it says. We write you now about what has always existed, which we have heard, we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at, which we have touched with our hands, we write to you about the word that gives life. He who gives life was shown to us. They're talking about Jesus right here. We saw him and can give proof about it. And now we announce to you that he has life that continues forever. He was with God the Father and was shown to us. <clears throat> we announce to you what we have seen and heard because we want you also to have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with God the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to you so you can be full of joy with us. Here is the message we have heard from Christ and now announce to you. God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. So if we say we have fellowship with God but we continue living in darkness, we are liars and do not follow the truth. But if we live in the light as God is in the light... We can share fellowship with each other. Then the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from every sin. If we say we have no sin, we are fooling ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He will forgive our sins because we can trust God to do what is right. He will cleanse us from all the wrongs we have done. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and we do not accept God's teaching. My dear children... I write this letter to you so you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have a helper in the presence of the Father, Jesus Christ, the one who does what is right. He is the way our sins are taken away. And not only our sins, but the sins of all people. We can be sure that we know God if we obey his commands. Pray with me. Jesus, this day... We want not just to know about you, we want to know you. Open your scripture to us. Speak to us that we too might hear, have ears that, that hear and we might be changed by it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. In 1947, Vladimir Zimchinkov came home after a long night of drinking in the bar. He was a clerk in post-World War II Russia. And when he got home, he realized that he couldn't find 400 ration cards that belonged to his boss. Well, post-World War II Russia, the only way you could survive was with ration card. And if you lost 400 of them, especially if they weren't yours, you would be fortunate if you were thrown in prison. Usually you'd be executed. And he was certain that at the very best he could hope for that he would be sent to Siberia to live in prison for a long, long time. So he and his wife hatched a plan. They decided that 
that he would hide in the house and that his wife would tell everyone that Vladimir had run off with another woman. So Vladimir Zimchenkov hid in his own house for 22 years. He never left the house. He hid so not to be found out. It wasn't until 1969 when his wife died that Vladimir Zimchenkov came out of the house for the first time. He went to the police station and he told them, I'm the one you've been looking for. I'm the one who had the 400 ration cards that went missing. They said, oh, we found those the day after you went missing. They were in your desk. He had been hiding for 22 years, hiding out of fear, hiding in the shadows because he was afraid. And that's what fear does to us. It sucks the life right out of us. It destroys everything around us. It calls us to the shadows, to the dark places in life, the places that we absolutely do not want to be. This morning I read from 1 John. John wrote a letter to the churches in Central Asia. Not just one or two, but all the churches. Ephesus, all the churches there, and churches in, in, in Greece. Because they were dealing with a heresy. A false teaching. And it was a teaching that um, was starting to infect the churches. It was an infection because it was causing people in the churches to fear. It was, it was this, this idea that people were trying to spread that, that split the churches between us and them. And the us people were the spiritual people and the them people were the non-spiritual people. The us people had a spe special knowledge that, that kept them a little higher, a little better, and it thrived on contempt. Contempt of the them people, those that weren't spiritual. That the spiritual people, they really didn't have to worry about anything because their special knowledge, they knew that they were spiritual and they didn't have to worry about the everyday ordinary things that, well, that had flesh, that had bodies, that had, was made up of matter that would decay and fall apart, that had aches and pains, that would get holes in them, that those were worries for the little people. That the spiritual people, they didn't have to worry about any of that because they were highly spiritual and they could treat their bodies like a playground if they wanted to. They could treat it like a demolition ground. They could do whatever they wanted to. And they weren't there to divide the church. They were there to cleanse the church. To get the unspiritual people out of there so the church could be what they thought the church needed to be. Spiritual. And 100% spiritual. Not a little bit spiritual. And they did this. They did this by saying that the true mark of the Christian church was contempt. Contempt for them. For those. For the other. So John, John's writing to a church that's hiding. They don't want to draw the contempt. They're hiding in the shadows. And John starts off his letter by talking about who he's seen that it's Jesus. Who he's heard that it's Jesus. Who he's touched. That Jesus had a real body. And he's inviting the people to come out. And in verse 4, he says, We write this to you so you can be full of joy with us. Not hiding in fear. Not hiding where life is sucked right out of you. Not hiding in the shadows, but full of joy. Not just a little bit of joy. And joy doesn't come from just an attitude. It doesn't come from an ideal. That joy comes from a practice. A practice. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Practice. The practice of joy and fellowship. First John chapter 1 verse 3 and 4. This is what he says. We announce to you what we have seen and heard because we want you to have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with God the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. We write this to you so you can be full of joy with us. 
And he goes on more to talk about fellowship after that. Fellowship is a word very often we don't use outside of the church. But we get an idea of it from an ancient practice that we still carry on today. Shaking hands. The shaking of hands shows that there's no weapon in our hand. That we don't just wave it and say, see here, no weapon. That we go one step farther to connect. To connect. And in the church, years ago, you used to call it the right hand of fellowship is what they called it. The connection. So often today, people see the connection. Yes, me, me and God got a good thing going, but everybody else can go pound sand. We have fellowship, but, you know, the fellowship with those around us isn't so important. John is saying just the opposite right here. He's saying, yes, we have fellowship with God the Father, but fellowship with one another, fellowship in Jesus Christ. That it's that connection to God, that connection with Jesus Christ, where he said, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm in their midst, that we have connection with one another, that we aren't off hiding in fear, that we aren't off in the shadows. That yes, we connect in worship to God and to one another. We connect to God and one another in the small group, in the Sunday school. Yes, and, and the, the, the place that we're trying to, to, to build out from the church, the commons area, where we connect with the community, where we have fellowship in Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 says, Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. That it's joy that comes in our connection with God and with one another. And that's the joy. That's the joy that comes in Jesus Christ. The joy and fellowship. And that's the joy that, that John wants to make sure that you and I know. And we practice. We practice joy and fellowship. And the second thing that I want to talk about, we practice joy and forgiveness. First John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. This is what it says. If we say we have no sin, we are fooling ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he will forgive us our sins because we can trust God to do what is right. He will cleanse us from all the wrongs we have done. Years ago, friend invited me to go to a lecture of Rabbi Harold Kushner. I don't know if you remember him. One of his most well-known books was When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Well, he wasn't talking about that book that night. He was talking about research that he had done for a book that he was writing. And in his research, he discovered that every tribe, every nation, every culture, and every subculture, that one of the first things they do is they set up a code a code of, of ethics to separate us and them. The good guys from the bad guys. And no matter what, the nation, the tribe, the culture, that, that that's very important to, to separate the insiders from the outsiders. And it didn't matter who it was that even thieves, we use it in our language, there's honor among thieves. Well, the honor among thieves is that you can steal from anybody you want to except another thief. That's the code. Those are the people who are bad. Those are the outsiders, those who steal from other thieves. That even in prisons, there's a prison culture. And the prison culture says, it doesn't make any difference what you did. You can rape, pillage, plunder, murder, no matter what it is. But there's one thing you don't do. You don't hurt a child. Those are the people that are outside the code. You could do anything else that you can still feel okay about yourself. When I was a kid, I tried very hard to be good. And I'll go ahead and tell you, I had limited success. So what I did was I tried a little harder. No, I tried a lot harder to be good. And the harder I tried, well, the more discouraged I got because I still had limited success. So I was about 8th or ninth grade, I guess, and, and I decided that, that that's when I would change my tactics. Rather than trying hard to be good, I'd just try and be better than someone else. 
I, that there was always somebody that was worse than I was, that, that I had a code. And as long as I was better than somebody that was worse than me, I could practice contempt and I could practice it freely. I didn't have to be good. I just had to be better than those who were bad. I think I first realized I was doing this when I was talking to a friend of mine. It was about ninth, tenth grade. And he was talking about getting drunk, and he said, well, you know, I, I get drunk. I drink, but I don't do drugs. Well, it wasn't fa- long after that that he did start doing drugs. And he said, well, I do drugs, but I don't ever buy drugs. You know, those are the bad people, the ones, if you just use somebody else's drugs, it's okay. But when he started buying drugs, he said, well, I buy drugs, but I don't sell drugs. Guess what he did next? Yeah, he started selling drugs. But he could always feel okay about himself as long as there was someone worse. Contempt is not a kingdom value. But it's the most natural thing in the world. This is the heresy that John is fighting. In chapter 4, verse 11, John says, If God so loved us, we ought to love one another. That it's not just pointing at somebody with a worse record. It's not just cleansing us and getting them out of the way. There's no joy in that. As a matter of fact, what there is is, well, misery, discouragement, there's fear, and there's loneliness. The joy comes in forgiveness. The life in Jesus Christ begins where our excuses stop. The cross. The cross. We don't offer our excuses at the cross, that it's at the cross we offer our confession. And hear the good news. What we receive is forgiveness. Forgiveness. John is is pointing to the cross of Jesus Christ that Jesus did on the cross for you and me what we couldn't do for ourselves. And so we lay our excuses at the foot of the cross. We lay our contempt at the foot of the cross. And what we receive is joy, the joy of His forgiveness. And we offer that forgiveness to others as well. John is speaking to you and me about what he's seen, what he's heard, what he's touched. And that's Jesus Christ. And he wants us to know that that Christ is available. His forgiveness is available now today to you and to me. His fellowship, it's available now today to you and me. And there's joy in it. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is the joy and obedience. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. This is what he says. He says, My dear children, I write this letter to you so you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have a helper in the presence of the Father, Jesus Christ. The one who does what is right. He is the way our sins are taken away. And not only our sins, but the sins of all people. We can be sure that we know God if we obey His commands. That there's joy in obedience. That it's not just go out there and and do the best you can. No. That there's an obedience that comes when Jesus lives his life through us. And there's a word in verse 2 that that many of the translations have that, that you might have stumbled over because... This translation, the New Century Version that I read this morning, it it doesn't use that word. And that word that some of your translations may have used is propitiation. I have never heard anyone use the word propitiation in a conversation. The reason why is the word propitiation right here in verse 2 has a literal meaning. It's not an idea. It's not a concept. It's the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. That it's that, that lid of the Ark of the Covenant. That, that in the Ark of the Covenant, that's where God's glory lived here on earth. And the lid is that, is that, that, that place where, where heaven and earth touch. And that's where Jesus Christ is. 
That's where his cleansing begins, where heaven touches earth. And it's, it's not out there somewhere that it's within us. It's in our hearts. Because Jesus is alive and is active as in real people, in real flesh. In our hearts where heaven touches earth. Dr. Christian Bernard was the first doctor who completed a successful heart transplant. One of his transplant patients, after his, his heart was, was taken out and someone else's heart was put in, he asked Dr. Bernard if he could see the old heart. Dr. Bernard showed him his old heart in formaldehyde in a jar. And that's when Dr. Bernard realized that this was an historic event. This was the first time anyone had ever seen their own heart. And this is what the man said. He said, I'm glad I don't have that old heart anymore. Well, that's what Jesus does for you and for me. He takes out that old heart. And he cleanses us. He gives us a new creation, a new heart. A new beginning that has his strength. That Jesus, the helper, lives within us and gives us strength that we don't have. That we're no longer alone. There's no reason to hide. There's no reason for fear. There's no reason to practice contempt. Because we're a new creation. A new heart, a new beginning. This is what William Temple says. He, he once said, It's no good giving me a play like Hamlet or King Lear and telling me to write a play like that. Shakespeare could do it, but I can't. And it's no good showing me a life like the life of Jesus and telling me to live a life like that. Jesus could do it, but I can't. But if the genius of Shakespeare could come and live in me, then I could write plays like that. And if the spirit of Jesus could come and live in me, then I could live a life like that. I have good news for you. Jesus rose from the grave so he could live in you and in me. He's the helper. He gives us a new heart, a new creation, starting right here in the old creation. This morning, it may be that you've not invited Jesus into your heart, and you've not known the joy of obedience, of obeying him, of following him. Now, I want to pray with you now. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, not one day, but this day. Not in someone else, but in us. You came to live your life that we might follow you. With your strength, we might be obedient. With your spirit, we might be able to obey and know of joy. A joy that's full. Not a joy that's frustrated, not a joy that's fearful, not a joy that's full of contempt. Not a joy that's discouraged first, but a joy that's full. Your joy. Breathe the power of your Spirit this day in us. It also may be that there are people this day that are something in their past. It's messing up their future. And it visits them every day because they haven't asked for your forgiveness. Or maybe it's something that's been done to them. May we know the power of your hand to cleanse, to forgive, to cleanse, and to bring a new start, a fresh start, a new creation that begins at the cross where we don't offer excuses. We offer our confession. And what we receive is forgiveness and power to forgive others. Jesus, it may be that there are people this day that don't know the joy of that forgiveness and don't know the joy of fellowship. It's a practice that you give us. And may that fellowship, the fellowship of coming together with other Christians, with other people to celebrate your presence, may it begin this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. 
Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image, and what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to Him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.